Well, welcome everybody. My name's Rob. I'm Kim. And I cannot believe that it's already August, Kim. Well, actually, the end of August. End of August. That means vacations are done. Kids are headed back to school. Yeah, everybody who's going back to school is back to school. You're and right. It, you know, that makes me think of back to school shopping. Mm. What was your, when you were growing up, mm-hmm. or when we had our kids and they were going back to school, what was your favorite part of back to school shopping? Mine was for school supplies, office supplies. I love the smell of the staple store. Yeah. But my, what's your favorite back to school item to had, shop for? It had nothing to do with notebooks and pens. It was sneakers. Loved going to buy the mm. sneakers as a kid and then helping the kids new buy shoes. those new shoes. New there shoes. There you go. That's cool. How about you jump in the chat and let us know what your favorite item to shop for for back to school is.
Just like a river wash over me Immerse me in water as deep as the sea Hide me in love, your healing embrace Peace like a river Wash over me As I worship your majesty
you've done it before, would you do it again? My name is Christina Edwards. I grew up in upstate New York, and I grew up being part of the Catholic Church. And I think faith was a little bit different for me when I was young. But um, yeah, we were we were altar servers. Um, you know, my parents were always volunteering at everything. So we were always very involved in church. Um, I think that it was a little bit different where I didn't have a deep relationship with Christ. I didn't quite understand that part of it. But I very much tried to live my life in a way that I was, you know, pleasing to God. And so it really was um, part of who I was. And, um, you know, and then you... You grow up and you go off to college and all of a sudden your parents aren't the ones telling you to practice your faith regularly. You're at college. I was excited about college. Um, I actually was one of those weird kids that enjoyed school. And so I, I was excited. I was excited to get out of my parents' house. I love my parents, but they were very strict. And so I was excited to kind of write my own path. And, you know, I, I didn't have anything specific that I was trying to necessarily accomplish. I was just you know, day to day, not really using something as that guide of how I was making decisions. It was more based on, oh, I'm enjoying this or I'm excelling at this, so let's do that. So it was just kind of, as things happened, it was like, oh yeah, that seems like a good idea. And you just take a step after a step after a step. And all of a sudden, you know, you can look up and not quite recognize your life or how you got to where you were. And that was definitely, um, you know, my story. I kind of reacted to things that happened to me rather than plan them out. And I didn't really know how to react in a healthy way. And so I, um, you know, I just tried to forget things of this world that were a problem by, you know, drinking a lot, going to parties, um, you know, and just trying to figure out how to put one foot in front of another. And all of a sudden, I found myself in a situation where uh, I was pregnant. And, you know, my, my boyfriend at the time, you know, he was so excited. And I just was looking at him like, I don't, I don't understand why you're excited. Do you understand? Like, we have to provide for this child. We have to figure out how to build a life for a child. That was definitely one of those moments that you wake up and you're like, I, I don't really recognize my, my life and I don't know how I got here. And, um, you know, that was the moment that it all changed for me. You know, I think it was in that moment that, um, you know, that Josh was born that I really saw him. And I think I was thinking through all the logistics before of the steps I needed to take to provide a life. But it was in that moment that it was just, I've got to help him do better. I've got to help him live his faith. You know, I just started to study the Word, but also with other people in a community of faith and share life and have them point to the Word as a way to try to figure out decisions and make decisions. And that was a little bit foreign for me, at least for a while. I'm like, okay, to make a decision, I've got to take it to God. And like. I've got to really understand why I'm feeling this way. I've got to figure out how to react in the right way. And I can use His Word to help guide those things. And I just got so much life out of it. And that's when I feel like instead of me starting to practice my faith because I want to set the right example for my son, all of a sudden it became real to me again. And, um, and I just haven't ever looked back. I mean, of course, you go through peaks and valleys with anything. But since then, uh, you know, it's just been so life-giving, and I've just um, loved growing and growing more and more in, uh, in my faith and in my journey. And, uh, you know, as Josh grew up, I just kept getting deeper and deeper into my faith. It is always so powerful to hear of someone's story, the impact that it has. Yeah, and God can use every one of our stories if mm -hmm. we're brave enough to share them. So that was awesome. If you are here with us for the very first time, we would love to know that, and we have a gift that we want to send you. So all we need to get from you is your email address on a Connect card, and be sure to let us know that it's your first time. And if you're in the middle of Try 5, would you let us know which try you're on that really helps? We would love to get a Connect card from everyone that's here because today we'll be sending out an email with all of the opportunities for community and community impact this fall. So let us know that you're worshiping with us online. To access the Connect card, you can either use LifePoint's app or you can text the word hello to 
to 919-948-7400 and we'll send the Connect card right to your phone so you can fill it out. Well, every week we take time to encourage us to be generous and talking about the opportunities in the fall, uh, in the community and here within the church, all of those things, uh, in order to, to have them, it takes the generosity of the church. And so thank you for your generosity. It is having an impact within the church and outside of the church. So we thank you for your generosity. To make a gift, you can use the LifePoint app or visit the website. Well, we have a new teaching series beginning today. Check this out. Drift. It's natural. Often we don't know we are drifting. We go from one thing to the next. Day after day, week after week. Then one day we look up and don't recognize where we are. Without a true north, we drift. We drift away from God, away from community, and away from mission. So how do we stop the drift? How do we find and follow true north? How do we stay connected? Today we're starting a brand new teaching series called Drift. We'll be talking about how we tend to drift away from what should be guiding us, our relationship with Jesus, the community where we can be challenged and grow, and the mission that God has for us. If we don't keep those things in focus, we will naturally start to drift away from them. And I'm excited about part one today because I've asked my good friend, Jarrett Hamilton, to speak to us. Jarrett and his wife, Jen, planted Generations Church in Clayton back in 2015, and they are making a huge difference in their city. Earlier this year, Jarrett and I got to speak at a couple conferences together, and when I heard him talk, it gave me the idea for this series, and it also gave me the idea to have him here at LifePoint to speak to us on this first week. Jarrett, we're happy to have you with us today. So church, together, let's welcome Jarrett right here to LifePoint. I recently had the chance to go to Harvard University. Uh, I didn't go as a student, but I had the chance to go and visit. I was with a group of pastors. And if you've ever been to Harvard, you know what an incredible place that is. Um, got to walk by the library. Four of the 10 stories of the library are actually built underground. There's millions of books. I think it's like 92 kilometers of bookshelves. Also about Harvard, only 4.6% of students that apply get in. So for every 100 students that apply to Harvard, 95 of them are rejected. But when you think about Harvard, you immediately, your mind is immediately drawn to what a prestigious university it is. Harvard was started in 1636 under the founding principle of preparing ministers of upright character, preparing ministers of the gospel. Their focus was on fulfilling their stated mission, which was to instruct students to know God and to know Jesus Christ. In 1692, Harvard adopted the motto that they were gonna be truth for Christ and the church. When you look at where Harvard began, their beginning is they were a university that prepared pastors and leaders to preach the gospel. Harvard was a sending institution, sending ministers of the gospel to be disciples that would make disciples. It was known as a place that would raise up and send people out. But today, when you think of Harvard, you don't think of that. Like if I were to ask you, hey, my son is looking to go into, into ministry. He wants to be a, a pastor or he wants to be a, a student pastor, whatever it is. And I said, what school would you recommend they go to? How many of us in here would say, oh, take them to Harvard? Like, of course we wouldn't recommend that because that's not what Harvard is today. And back in 1987, the president of Harvard said that the school had left its original mission with no hope of ever going back. Harvard experienced what in the business world is referred to as mission drift. Mission drift is when an organization shifts from its initial focus. It's actually the tendency of all business. All business starts with this, with this great goal, this great focus, but then as you start to add customers and you start to add staff, the natural tendency is to drift away from your original focus. It's our human tendency as well. Have you ever noticed that our human tendency is to drift or to, or to move away from our, our focus or our target? 
And we never drift in a positive direction. We always are pulled in a negative direction. If you're married and you never put any emphasis or any time invested in that relationship, you will find over, the, over time, over the years, that your relationship has drifted and you haven't drifted closer to your wife or to your husband. We always drift further away. I like to, to golf, I'm not very good, but when I don't practice, my swing gets further and further away from the goal, not closer to it. It's the natural human tendency is to drift away from the goal, to drift away from the target or the focus. You know, the same thing is true in our relationship with Jesus. Like left alone, we are not going to drift closer to him. We are going to drift further and further away from him. And I think for many of us this morning, there's, there's a tension that we feel. We understand and recognize that we're drifting further and further away from our relationship with Jesus. And we feel the tension, we feel the distance and we feel bad about it. I don't know that I've ever met anybody that said to me, yeah, I'm drifting further and further away from Jesus, but I couldn't be happier about it. Like there's a sense within us, even right now, when we talk about it, there's something within us. It's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that says there is a distance in this relationship that doesn't have to be there, that the Holy Spirit does not want us to feel, does not want us to experience. You know, it's almost as if Jesus knew that this was going to happen. Like think about Jesus, when he called the disciples to follow him, he invited them into the journey of life. And for three years, they walked with him every single day. And Jesus, knowing that he's going to die, he's going to be buried, he's going to rise again. He's going to spend a few weeks with them, but eventually he's going to ascend into heaven. And knowing that, and knowing the human tendency is that we are going to drift, that they were going to drift from that relationship with him, Jesus challenged them about that. And the challenge for them 2,000 years ago is the same challenge that exists for us today. And we find it in John chapter 15. So John 15 are words of Jesus that he delivered less than 24 hours before he died. These are truly some of the last things that he wanted his disciples to hear. He wanted his disciples to know. And in John 15 verse one, he says, I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. Now to you and I, this just sounds like, you know, a gardening analogy, but for a first century Jew, there was this, this went a lot deeper. This was a lot more significant. Anytime the use of the image of the vine appeared in the Old Testament, it emphasized the nation of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. Like anytime they talked about the vine, they would always talk about the, the, the lack of fruit that the vine was producing. It always meant that the nation of Israel did not bear the fruit that God intended. And so when you would see Jesus curse vines or curse plants or trees, it was always about the nation of Israel. And it was always about their inability to be faithful, their inability to produce fruit. So Jesus comes along and he says, I am the true vine. You guys couldn't get it right, but I'm the one that did. I'm the one that finally got it right. Jesus came along and through all of life, he was constantly introducing himself not as just the better version of what we've been looking to, but as the complete version of what we've been looking to. He was constantly telling them, man, you look to Moses, let me show you the better version of Moses. You look to these feasts, let me show you the better version of these feasts. You look to the temple, let me show you the complete version of the temple. And he said, I am the better, the complete version of all of these imperfect images that you've been looking to. And he says, you know about the vine, you know about the fruitlessness of the nation. You know about their inability to do what I called them to do. But I want you to know that I did what they were incapable of doing. I lived my life in such a way, my sacrifice and offering for sin has given me the authority that is needed to be able to declare that I am the, the true vine. There is no other true vine. And in verse two, he says, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. If you're into gardening, you know this is true. The branches that are, that are not producing fruit are dying and those are the ones that are sucking nutrients away from the branches that are, so, so you remove them. And he goes on and says, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. Jesus says, I am the vine and if you stay connected to me, 
you are going to produce fruit. But if you are going to produce fruit, you've got to understand that there is a pruning process that is going to be involved. It's a constant reminder that Jesus gave us that following him was not going to be easy, that there was going to be a cost involved. There was going to be sacrifice involved. At times it was going to be a struggle to follow him. And for a lot of us here this morning, we have bought into a false belief that following Jesus makes your life easier, makes your life better. Man, follow Jesus and you'll get that job, you'll get that house, you'll get the car, you'll get the girl, all of your problems will go away. And man, it sounds good. That's an easy message to preach. The only problem is you'll never see it in the Bible because Jesus never said that. Jesus said, following me is going to cost you something. Following me at times is going to be painful. He wants us to produce fruit. And in order to produce fruit, he says, at times I've got to prune you. At times I've got to cut you. At times there's going to be suffering involved in this journey. And in verse three, he says, but you have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. So this is a statement about the future. Jesus is talking to the belief in the resurrection. Think about Peter, Peter's declaration. Peter said, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, you've already been pruned. You've already been purified by this message I have given you because you've received it and because you believe it. And then in verse four, he says, now remain in me. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. I'm the vine, you are the branches and apart from me, you can do nothing. Because when you look at your life, when I look at my life, obviously we can still do good stuff. Like for a lot of us, a lot of us here this morning, we're still doing the the good things that a Christian is supposed to do. Even as we're drifting further and further away from Jesus, as we're becoming more and more complacent and apathetic about our pursuit of him and our walk with him, we're still managing to, to do good things. But just because you're doing good things doesn't mean you're doing them in the power of Jesus doesn't mean that they have eternal significant value. Things like giving money, serving, reading our Bibles, connecting with God through prayer, those are all good things. For a lot of us, what our our spiritual journey, what our spiritual life has been reduced to is we're just simply checking all of the boxes. We're doing things out of obligation and out of duty. We're functioning apart from him. We're doing good, but we're doing good in our own strength. And for many of us, we're, we're comfortable to navigate through life that way, aren't we? I mean, we keep Jesus around. I mean, Jesus is around in case we need him. Like he's around on an as-needed basis. Like Jesus, I wanna keep you around in case I need something. And it's almost as if we've forgotten our role in this relationship. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Branches only produce fruit if they stay connected to the, to the vine. And it's almost like at times we wanna reverse roles. Like, I wanna be the vine. I want Jesus to be the branch. Jesus calls us to follow him. And at times in my life, I feel like I'm trying to to reverse the roles and being like, Jesus, why don't you follow me? Like, Jesus, I think I've got a good plan. I've got a good system. I wish you would just get on my page. And Jesus says, that's not how this works. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing of eternal or of significant value. You know, when I look at the last 17 months or so, I think back to March of last year when COVID kind of reshaped everything. And I saw as people in their pursuit of Jesus, it just sort of spiraled out of control. One thing I learned about my life, one thing I learned about the lives of the people that I pastor, is that when things are good, we trust Jesus that when things are not going so well is when we question whether or not he's truly sovereign, whether or not we're willing to truly rely on him as the source. COVID exposed a lot of things. 
I think it exposed that in many of our lives, Jesus is a resource, but Jesus is not our source. Jesus says, if you want to produce fruit, you've got to remain in me. And he says, if you remain in me, I'm going to remain in you and you will produce fruit. And if you look at your life and you inventory your life and you say, man, I don't like what my life is producing. The problem is that we're not staying connected to the vine. It's, it's a surrender issue. We're not surrendering control of all of our lives to him. We're not submitting to, to him as Lord and Savior of our life. Because Jesus says, if we remain in him, we are going to produce fruit. But for so many of us, rather than remaining in him, we're drifting further and further away from him. And so we sense the drift, right? We sense the disconnect and we go, okay, how do I fix it? If you jump down to verse 18, Jesus continues this conversation and he says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my father. And if you and I do nothing else in this life but produce fruit, then we are bringing glory to God, which is ultimately the purpose of our lives is to glorify him. Then in verse nine, he says, I have loved you. Even as the father has loved me, remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. He says, I love you. I have already loved you. I have always loved you. And even as you and I drift in that relationship, as we become apathetic, as we be become complacent, as we become distant, the one truth we can always cling to is that regardless of where we are in our pursuit of him, that he loves us. He says, I have loved you even as the father has loved me. That's regardless of anything else. That's just a statement of fact. I have loved you even as the father has loved me. That's the truth that we can anchor to. And again, I said just a minute ago, when we feel the drift, we feel the tension, we wanna know how do I fix it? Like what's, like what's the list? You're probably thinking that this morning. You, you sense and are aware of, of a drift and you go, okay, well, how do, I, how do I change it? How do I fix it? And if you're anything like me, I'm, I'm someone that likes to fix things. When someone presents a problem to me, I don't wanna talk about the problem, I just wanna fix it. Remember when everything happened and COVID sort of reshaped everything last year, we had a staff meeting early on and I told the guys on our team, I said, we're not gonna spend the next three hours talking about how we feel about the problem because three hours from now, we're gonna still have an unsolved problem. So let's, let's talk solutions, let's figure out what we're gonna do, let's, let's fix it. And that's how I operate in this conversation. Man, I'm drifting from God, so what do I do to fix it? What do I do to change it? And then you read verse 10, and it almost sounds like it gives us the solution, and the solution is, well, just be obedient. It says, when you obey, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. It sounds like, just give me the list. Let me just be obedient. Well, here's the problem with that. Obedience alone will not lead you to love. Obedience alone leads us to, to legalism. Legalism is my attempt to earn or maintain God's love and favor through religious activity. You could say legalism is right behavior with wrong belief. It's doing the good things, it's doing the right things, but it's doing it with the wrong motivation. I was doing all those things we talked about a few minutes ago, like worshiping together, giving your money, sacrificing your time, doing things for your neighbors. All of those things are good things, but what is it that is motivating you? What is it that is driving you? Are you doing it so that you will love God or are you doing it in hopes that he will love you? Obedience doesn't lead us to love. Obedience doesn't lead us to love, but a love for Jesus will lead us to obedience. Here's how, here's how I would articulate it. I don't obey God in order to love him or to be loved by him. I am loved and because I am loved as I remain in that, the only response then is obedience. It's difference in perspective. Am I doing things in order to be loved or am I doing things because I am loved? Am I operating toward love or am I operating from love? Remaining in his love, Jesus says, will produce obedience. 
In my house, uh, my wife, Jen, we've been married. January will be our 25th anniversary. And Jen just likes when our house functions in a certain way. She's always cared about things that, to be honest with you, I really don't care about. We got married at 19 years old, and she has always cared about making the bed in the morning. When I say the morning, I mean like every single day. Part of the reason I moved out when I was 18 was so I wouldn't have to make the bed. She wants to wash the dishes every day. We are a family of five, and so there's a lot of dishes in our house. I'm constantly frustrated because I'm more of a minimalist. If I had my way, we'd each have our own spoon, fork, knife, one cup, one bowl, one plate, and that would be it. And then Jen says to me, well, what, what about when we have people over? I'm like, well, just use paper plates that day. It's not, it's not that big a deal. But these are things that created tension in our marriage when, uh, in our early years. And in the early years of our marriage, this stuff was just annoying to me. If I did them, it certainly was not because I loved her. I did them to keep from starting a fight. I did them out of obligation. I did them out of a sense of, of duty. And about a year and a half into our marriage, we knew we were in trouble. And so we went to an older couple that was uh, a part of our church and we asked them for help. And they sat us down over lunch and I think we only met with them a couple of times. And, but they said, I want you to go home and I want you to each write down five things that you love value or appreciate about each other. And then I want you to communicate those to each other. And then in your daily relationship, I want you to focus on those. I want you to operate in those. In the context of this conversation, essentially what they said is we, we want you to, to remain in those things. And you know, something really cool started to happen in our relationship as we took that to heart. My love for her grew and as my love for her grew, I started wanting to do the things that she cared about. So make this connection with God. The more you fall in love with Jesus, the more you're going to want to be obedient to him. The goal isn't to be obedient. The goal is to fall in love with him more every day. The more you fall in love with Jesus, the natural progression, the natural response is you're go going to want to do the things he cares about. You're going to want to do the things that he's called and commanded you to do. And in our relationship, my love for Jen, I began to embrace the things that she cared about her. My love for her influenced my behavior. Now, when Jen goes out of town, I make the bed every single day. I still don't make the bed because I wanna make the bed. I make the bed because I know it's something that she cares about and I know it's something that, that she values. But for me, doing all of those things are now motivated from a place of love. I'm not trying to be loved by her. I'm now operating from a place of knowing that I am loved and my love for her is motivating and is reshaping the behavior. That's critical to grasp when you and I process our drift from God. Again, back in verse nine, Jesus says, I have loved you. Like, like remain in that, believe that, trust that. Remain in that love, and when you remain in that love, you, the, the product, the result is going, to be, is going to be obedience. And so for you and I, we've got to preach that truth over ourselves, the truth that we are loved. That regardless of where I am, regardless of what I did yesterday, regardless of what I'll do today, what I'll do tomorrow, I know no matter what, nothing can separate me from his love. I preach the truth of that love over my life. This morning, you've got to know and believe that he loves you. He hasn't stopped loving you. Even though you've been drifting from him, he still desires closeness with you. God isn't mad at you. And there are times in this journey where when we sense he's mad at us, the natural tendency is like Adam and Eve is to hide. He doesn't want us to hide, he wants closeness. So you gotta preach that truth over your life that, that you are loved. Operate from a place of, of being loved. And then this is something I was challenged with recently by uh, one of the pastors that I like to listen to. His name's Matt Chandler. He preaches at a church in, uh, pastors a church in Texas. And he said this, and this is something that has really reshaped the way I view this, this pursuit of Jesus. He said, find the things that stir your affection for Christ and saturate your life in them. Find the things that rob you of that affection 
and walk away from them. Essentially, he says, do things that stir your affection for Christ. Surround yourself with things that stir your affection for Christ. I think just where you are right now, stop and process that. What stirs my affection for Christ? Not necessarily what stirs my emotion. Sometimes emotions are a product of stirred affections, but don't link the two. What stirs my affection? And as I've thought through and processed that, I've thought about a number of things that, that exist in my life that are significant as far as helping draw me close to him, things that stir my affection for him and saturating my life in that. My house, I've got, a, I've got a fire pit. I actually have two, one in the backyard and one in the front yard. Uh, I'm more of an introverted person. So the one in the backyard is where I spend the majority of my evenings in the, the fall, in the spring, especially on a Sunday night. When we put the one out in the front, we always invite the neighbors over. So my youngest daughter recently announced that all the, at a get together with all of our neighbors, we're sitting out front around our, our burn barrel. And she goes, hey, just so you guys know, if the burn barrel's out, you're welcome here. But if my dad's burning a fire in the backyard, you're not welcome. And so it's like, you know, <laughs> thank you, Hannah. But my fire pit is one of those places where I sit, it's quiet. It's a place where I talk to God and I try to listen. Just sitting around a fire, being alone is something that, that stirs my affection for Jesus. Things like God's creation. Man, if you ever get a chance to get in a place that has a beautiful sunrise or sunset, like the mountains or at the beach, maybe it's things like time with your family. We're busy, we're running constantly, and just those times where you slow down and just spend time together, maybe that stirs your affection for him. For me, one of the things, I cannot believe I'm saying this, but one of the things that stirs my affection for him is running. I find when I run that that is a time where I'm able to, uh, again, the only distraction in my mind is pain, but I'm able to focus on him. I'm able to talk to him. I'm able to listen. Worshiping together. Man, doing this in, a, in, in the, the context of a church family, this is such a powerful and stirring time. And this is something I love doing every single week that we get to worship him together as a family. Like this truly stirs my affection for him. I'd encourage you, I challenge you to make your own list. Like what is it that stirs your affection for him? And invest your life, invest time in doing things that stir those affections and then remove and avoid things that rob them. Galatians chapter five talks about the, the works of the, the flesh, the works of the old nature. Some of the things that we, we need to remove are, are really obvious. Like if you read Galatians five, Colossians three, immorality, lust, evil, envy, drunkenness, all those things, those are easy things to go, okay, I don't need those things in my life. Those are not stirring my affections. Those are stifling my affection for him. But some of the things are less obvious. Hebrews 12 talks about us laying aside the, the weight and the sin. It talks about the sin, yes, but the weight. The weight are those things in life that are not necessarily bad, but are things that are holding us back. In your life, what is it that stifles your affection for him? <laughs> Maybe it's the news in like any form right now, or sports or a hobby, something that you're saying yes to, that saying yes to that repeatedly is keeping you from saying yes to whatever it is that Jesus is calling you to. And so you gotta identify what is it that stirs that affection and focusing on the things that stir that affection, operating from a place of being loved. Those are the things that, that, that keep us from drifting further and further away and that continue to draw us closer and closer in. Man, this morning, you've got to know and believe that he loves you. That the drift that exists in your relationship is not because of him. It's because of you. It's because of me. Like when there's a disconnect in that relationship, nothing has changed on his end, but it's changed on ours. And we've got to acknowledge it. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to shine a light on that brokenness, and then show us what it looks like to, 
become more like Jesus. Show, show us what it looks like to draw closer to him. Would you pray with me? Father, we know that nothing can separate us from your love. That nothing in this world, nothing in the, the sky above, nothing we have done, nothing we will do can separate us from your love. We know that you desire closeness with us. And Jesus, we know that you provide the solution to the drift that is happening in our relationship. God, I pray over anyone this morning that is questioning your love, that they would know and believe that they are loved. Think about Paul's writing in Ephesians, the first three chapters. He doesn't tell us to do anything. He just reminds us of all that we are, all that we have in Christ. And for the one who's battling guilt, wrestling with shame, and we just preach the word of love, we preach the gospel over them. And as we drift, Father, would you help us identify and cling to saturate our lives with those things that stir that affection for you? Holy Spirit, we know that you're present, that you're speaking. Pray that you would show us what isn't right and lead us and guide us to that relationship that you desire from us that is going to lead us to being uh, fruitful disciples. And Jesus, I pray all this in your name. Amen. This week, I've been thinking about and praying for a friend of mine who has been drifting away from God and seems to be avoiding church lately. I don't think it's because she stopped believing in God, and I don't think it's because she stopped loving God, but I think that she might have a wrong idea about God's love for her. She might think that if she turns her face to Jesus, she'll find that He's turned His back on her. Or maybe she's afraid of how it will feel to see how much he loves her in spite of her sin. Let's be honest, haven't we all been there? I know I have. But that's not the way God's love works. 
Psalm 103 says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Communion is a time during our worship experience when we remember God's mercy and celebrate the forgiveness offered to us because of what Jesus did on the cross. Today, spend some time reflecting on your life lately. Is there something you need to ask forgiveness for? Is there something you need to confess? Take some moments to turn your face toward God. Invite Him in to help you turn your back on sin. When you're ready, take the bread and the cup that represent Jesus' shed blood and broken body. Thank Him for His forgiveness and mercy. And then, through the power of the Holy Spirit, turn and walk in a new direction. God, thank you that your love for us never changes. Thank you for the forgiveness that's possible to us. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Well, we were so glad that you're here with us today. And if you'd like to share today's experience with your friends, you can do that using LifePoint's app or share our YouTube channel. We can't wait to see you again soon.